in the sketch entry, there's a link to a Google Docs document where we will take notes and collect questions to discuss. So uh, everyone just join that and uh, vote for topics. And Woven will show the slides that page in a second. immediately. <laughs> I think we can just skip the slides and just move to the pad. I can also show the slides. It just takes me a second to set them up. Yeah, unfortunately, we are scheduled during the lunch break because there's not enough slots. So um, I had some lunch, so I wouldn't be asleep <laughs> or hungry when we gave the talk. Um, So, yeah. <laughs> Working on it. I'm just going to start. So, uh, from everyone here, uh, those people in the back, please come closer so it's easier to hear you. Um, yeah, we're going to have a buff on automated testing and board farming. We had one two years ago in, in Dublin, I think. Ah, this is it's the wrong one. Uh, also. The notes from last time are also linked in the pad. So, who of you has a board farm at home or at the company? Hey. Well, maybe half? Ah. Ah. So, and I'd ask you to join the pad and uh, add a plus to the project that you're using for your board farm or add your project. So, uh, just do it live. Uh, so, we got one for lava. And I should add mine. We've sorted them by GitHub stars. That is totally scientific. So we're going to... Ah, some more people for LabGrid. I expect we have someone here using Fuego. And maybe someone MTDA from Siemens. Um, uh, this is the URL. And it's also linked on the sketch. So it's in the sketch slides. You can download the slides if you have a laptop in front of you, or you can use your phone and scan the QR code. And it's also on the schedule entry in the description. So just follow this short URL and follow the link there. So yeah, we have 16 additional or 20 people in the pad right now. So just start voting, adding your projects if we don't know about them yet. It's always interesting to know what people are using outside, uh, out there. So, and we're also collecting topics to discuss. I've brought some questions with me, um, but I'd also like to discuss other topics which, which we, you bring and hear feedback from you. So, um, yeah, we already started with the first questions. Which projects do you use? Collecting uh, stars there. Lots of LabGrid stars, nice. Um, and do you also have some recommendations for new board farming automated projects that are not yet in the list or maybe less known than they should be? So just raise your arm and I'm going to come around with a microphone so you can say something about that. Or are you just here to hear about projects which we already know about? No raised hands. So, question, uh, next question in my list here. Maybe show, show the pad? I'll, I'll switch over to the document. Or uh, do you want the pad we created earlier? Hmm? Do you want the pad or the Google document? The Google document. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, Next question from my side, so what's new in your lab in the last two years? So maybe from our side in LabGrid, we've moved uh, at least in master from the existing uh, yeah, communication bus framework, which we were using, which was called Autobahn and Crossbar, which was not really maintained anymore. So the big change uh, recently was that we moved that over to gRPC. So the coordinator is now a gRPC server and the client and the exporter connect to it over gRPC and that should be much more maintainable in the future. So that's the 
the biggest change on the lab grid side. We've been adding minor drivers and so on as well. And also in our physical lab, we have started adding our uh, test controller boards. I'll show a bit. So small, a Linux-based PC with Ethernet and all the interfaces most of our boards needs and USB. So we connect our devices on a test to those and get rid of all these large USB buses which are not very stable. So yeah, that's a short summary of what's new in LabGrid in our lab. So I'd like to hear about what's new in your labs. Or what are problems you're encountering? What are devices you can't access? What are interfaces that are missing? Are you missing anything? Are you happy with your solutions? If you are happy, what are you happy about? Not really a problem, but I just started my lab like a week ago. So there's only one PC in there and I'm starting to get it working. And I had the question, I'm started to use LabGrid for it. And uh, I was wondering about the LabGrid exporter. Can I somehow abstract away the power controller? Because I, if I'm on my bench, I have my, my power, my lab net, uh, network, uh, my power supply network, in my fact, which I control via Visa. But if I want to move it then to the bench or have another equal something in the, in the, in the rack thing, then I probably don't have a lab, uh, power, net, uh, power supply in there but like controllable power socket or something like that. So how can I abstract it away that the CI can run on both? So in LabGrid, uh, the drivers implement so-called protocols, which might be inter called interfaces as well. So you have different power drivers for the different actual power hardware, and they all implement the same power control protocol. And your test suite only needs to know about this power control protocol. Um, then I've got the exporter, one is running on my PC and one is running on another PC in the rack space and the ex uh, uh, exporter are only exporting resources or can they also export drivers? So the exporter only exports resources. You would have basically maybe two exporters connected to the same coordinator and they export the physical sockets and the physical lab power supply and then you configure different places where you put your board and that point to the correct uh, interfaces and then your strategy or environment YAML has different configurations for, for those. So in your test suite you basically have two YAMLs which one is for the uh, for lab supply and one is for the uh, rack mounted place. But your test code itself doesn't need to know. We've been thinking about adding support in the coordinator to configure drivers for places. But that would be interesting, but we haven't found time to do that so far. Someone else? Nothing else? Ah. Um, I'm using LabGrid. Uh, I set up the lab, it was, I think, uh, one year from now. Uh, it's working great. Um, what One issue that I encountered was uh, we are using boards that are um, programmed using USB. In order to program them via the CI, we are using Big and Bold and Black uh, to emulate a USB key. Uh, so the target and the Big and Bold and Black attached to this target uh, are two different places. And one thing that I, wait, I, I ended up using a prefix uh, in order to, I, I have slot one uh, that is locked. I want to program it. So I need to lock slot one dash EBB. Uh, do you have any plan on supporting side hardware, side places? So in our lab, I think on the Beagle One Black, that would be an exporter running there. Okay, but so in, in our architecture, basically the idea is to have all the infrastructure <coughs> side which controls the device under test as exporters and not a different device 
as a, as a device uh, under or as a place. You can do it that way. But yeah. Uh, for this to work, we need one exporter per Beagle Bone Black. Okay, I, s I see. Uh, okay, so right now we have just one exporter uh, giving access to everything, and we added places for Beagle Bone Black. Okay, maybe that, that could be an idea. Thank you. So, so all the infrastructure that is distributed in, in your racks and so on that can come from a single exporter or from many ones? Because you can have a single place use resources from one, two, three exporters and combine them into a single place. So that would be my in initial suggestion. Okay, I've got a question. Um, or maybe uh, I feel like I might be um, not smart enough to do this kind of stuff. Uh, every time I hook up an FTDI serial USB to serial converter to like a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone or something, I always have to tie the clear to send line to ground uh, because Linux uh, won't transmit characters back. And so, like, does anyone else have that problem? I, it's like I see all these pictures on the internet where people just have three wires connected, and I'm going, that doesn't work for me. I always have to have yeah. fourth wire. Yeah. There's that. <laughs> okay, so the comment was he. Yeah. No, I, I've run into it too, and I just, uh, I was using, what was I using? Uh, uh, the terminal Minicom. And I just ended up having to turn off Echo to, to get any work done. Um, and, it, and it worked just fine after that. But, was it turn off Echo? Well, for when I went to use Minicom. So it depends on what you're trying to do. So you didn't have to hook up an extra wire? In my case, I didn't have the option. It was someone else had done that for me. But yeah, I, I ran into the same thing. So I, I think that should be possible using... I, I think it should be possible by just uh, disabling hardware flow control with, via SDDY. If that doesn't work, it's probably kernel bug. But we know people who can fix kernel bugs. I looked at kernel serial line options rather than minicon options. Maybe that was my mistake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll so I, I, in our lab, which uh, where we use uh, Serto.net on our exporters, we haven't seen that problem. And when it's about um, connected ground plans, I think, when you're, it's, can it be that you're using your FTDI serial adapter only with your floating notebook, not connected to a power source, and modern um, power supplies, don't connect to ground level. There's the switching power supplies don't have a ground level connection, and so it can be that every line is floating, and you just need to get another um, a master ground connection between the board and the programmer. Yeah, that might be the case. So I'm maybe looking at uh, what additional questions. So we have uh, Tom asking if he should. Use libgpld for GPIO handling. If it's possible with GPIO manager now, where's Tom? Yeah. So uh, in LabGrid we're currently using uh, SysFS. Yeah. And because we connect via SSH and need to have the line stay at what we set it to, but that should be possible with GPIO manager now. I'm not really sure if I like. A debus daemon and separate daemon for just controlling a single bit in a register, but it would work for that bit. Yes, and the problem is that we have Raspberry Pi and there are USB to FTDI converters and they are GPU devices. So it depends how okay. we enumerate it and we are losing track to CCFS uh, numbers. Of course, we ca you can handle it by UDEV, but yeah. Yeah, You would still need to have this mapping if you have USB devices, but uh, the LabGrid exporter already talks to you to, to do all this mapping. And if you, yeah, we can either map it to a GPIO index with SysFS or a GPIO chip with an index. It should be similar. I2C and or SPI slaves to inject sensor errors. Who asked that? Interesting question. From software which is written uh, and, and, and un un unable to mock away errors, to mock away devices in software. 
So you have to do it in, in hardware somewhere, somehow. So you have a solution for that. Did you, did you do that ever? Program an I2C slave or an SPI slave? It's a, it's, a, it's a slave device where you simulate the product, the protocol, you implement the protocol, and you check who should uh, So far in our lab, we don't have that. Um, it, on some boards, we use SPI loopback to yeah, do just basic testing for driver works, but you won't find any difficult problems with EMA with that and so on. We use it for USB in some cases, so a separate device using a USB gadget to emulate something but not for SPI or SQLC. But if anybody has done that, I'd be interested. Ah, yeah. yeah I, I think well, from Zhang even has a kernel module for that, which is upstream to use that for uh, testing uh, recovery from buses so for SQLC. So I think that's upstream. I think there's a presentation about that on ELC five or six years ago. Ah, I see. So you can manipulate the upstream kernel to inject errors during device communication or only for recovering from bus faults. I, I, I guess we need to look up the talks again. I'm not sure how it works again. I may have to do something with wiring, uh, adding a, connecting a GPIO to the ah, bus yeah. as well, so introduce mm. errors. I don't know the details, and unfortunately, Wolfram is not here because of the, the train issue. Yeah, so something like connecting a GPIO and then just pulling on the line during communication is already kind of possible, although with the current solutions, at least in LabGrid, it's hard to get the timing right because you only have a very short time frame where the transmission takes place and you would have to pull on the GPIO at the exactly right time. So. Yeah, but you could just uh, um, connect a uh, digital output. That's what we generically call it, and then. Yeah. So, so uh, if you get that working, there's uh, on the eLinux wiki it's linked a uh, mailing list for automated testing. So, I encourage you to report back if, if you get that working in some way, so others can can use that as well. It is possible to 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 write to see slaves to to write to see slaves. Yeah, um, there might also be the option to have, uh, so for USB I know there is the, can basically emulate a USB gadget on the same host and connect it to a virtual host controller. But I, I think that might also be possible for SPI. So you can, don't need, we actually need the target, you can just in the kernel map it to some software emulation. That might also be possible for SPC. So it's not really a topic for a hardware control or both fun, but it's for testing it's very useful. Next question. Uh, Advice on handling boards yeah. on which you also do dev work, assuming you don't have many boards available. Yeah, so that was one of the main reasons why we built LabGrid instead of continuing to use Lava, because Lava is mainly focused on having a central scheduler and you submit jobs there and they run on some board and you get the result back. There is some support for doing interactive work but it's not really integrated. And so Labgrid basically tries to cover both use cases, interactive and CI. So, that's, yeah. so in my lab I have the same problem. I have a couple of boards that are I normally have like one instance of and I usually have uh, two kernels. I don't change the root file system very much, but I, I'll either boot, it, boot into a safety kernel, which is like a production kernel uh, or a test kernel. And so that's what led to my question is, it'd be nice to have a, a firmware standards for, for that type of configuration where you just have two kernels you're switching between. One is known to be good and the other, like if it fails, it falls back to the other one. Yeah, so the idea behind is uh, that is that you have some kind of health check to verify that hardware still works, right? Because um, we also kind of implemented that, but it's not uh, upstream anywhere. I, I think it may be upstream in the test suit for the test automation controller. No, I, I think um, that one contains health checks. So this bringing a board in a known good state uh, topic is done in Leopard basically by always reprovisioning everything when you start using the board. 
So you don't care what your colleague has done to the board before. You write a new bootloader, write a new URL file system kernel and everything. Basically, the output of your CI build or your local build. So don't depend on any software state. So I actually supported this in Nava. I mean, bypassed this. Uh, it was eight years ago now. And I did a presentation at the ELC in Berlin, so you can look this up. Uh, so it's called Lavabo, and it's still on uh, GitHub.com, Bootlean, Lavabo, something like this. It's ancient now because you know, I've been been there for a while. But uh, I'm not at a company anymore, so I cannot say <laughs> if they're still using it. Um, so I think it's part of how Geth was doing this. So we have SSH um, going through this, and um, use the Lava API to lock the, the device out of Lava, basically. And you can control the power and everything through this. Um, and you have the serial and going through serial uh, to net. I don't know exactly the name anymore. It's been a long time. But uh, so you have a way to do this with Lava uh, by bypassing it. But uh, you still have the, the CI and everything. And then you can unlock it. And this was required for remote workers, obviously, when you only have one time one board, you don't have an option, so, um, yeah, that's it. Any comments on this topic from someone else? No, um, in, in LabWord, maybe uh, a related topic is that when we write a test suite for a board, we have a so-called strategy which knows how to initialize a board, flash everything, and so on, and you can also use that strategy for interactive work. So we can basically tell the lab client use this strategy to bring this board with these artifacts into a Linux shell. So if a colleague doesn't want to do bootloader development or is not intimately familiar with that board, you can just use the test suite that run maybe nightly in the, in the CI to bring the board in a defined state. And it's, it's the same code that runs in CI. Any comments on that question or topic? Um, so how long does the loop for rebuilding a kernel and reflushing it take now? If you don't do it directly from your PC, but do it through Labrit? Um, so when doing interactive kernel development, for example. Yeah, so um, in that case, uh, we usually log in via SSH to our build servers because they build kernels fast and call Labrit client locally there. So in that case, the client connects directly to the exporter, writes a kernel via the fast boot or something. And so it's just a few seconds after the kernel build fi uh, finishes that you upload the kernel directly via USB to the target and then it boots. How big is the overhead of it? The overhead? How much time is added? Um, so the laptop client starts up in a second or something. So it, it's basically just like if you board was directly connected to your development machine via USB. Yep. Uh, that, that was one of the main points which we wanted to get really fast for our kernel developers so that they don't waste time waiting on, on a, a scheduler and so on. So you lock your board, keep that locked and interactively use it. Keep the serial console open and just power cycle the board, upload the kernel and then you're back to testing the new kernel. to a lab with marketing presentation right now. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to go on about uh, my lab briefly. Um, I've got about 30 boards. Uh, I've got them hooked up in uh, LabGrid. I was using TBOT and some uh, ha hacked up stuff in there. And I've done a PR, which you've probably seen, with about 60 patches in it. So I'd really like to get that upstream. Um, and one of the things that, well, apart from the fact that of getting review bandwidth, part of the problem, uh, as I understand it, is you don't want uh, anything doing any building in the in the lab grid. So I wanted to, at some point, argue with you about that. Yeah. So uh, we we have some uh, part in the documentation where we uh, say what sh what lab grid is and what it isn't. So from the beginning, we didn't want to have uh, LabGrid be a build system because 
I've seen with other test systems that they are very closely integrated into building stuff, and we wanted to, there are so many different ways to build stuff, and we wanted to be able to test the exact images that our customers are using in the field. So we use BuildRoot, Jogdo, PTXDIS to build images, and we wanted to use those artifacts on the, um, via LabGrid on those boards. And it's, from the interface is designed in a way, it's pretty easy to take external images and push them into LabGrid. That's at least what we're doing. Okay. Uh, the problem is you don't know which files you need. It's board specific. So, so we use right, so the strategy knows, in, in my case, there's a separate class, but it's, there is something in LabGrid that, that knows what files it needs to put on the board. So in LabGrid, there are two or three uh, strategies, which I'd say are mostly examples. And the expectation is that if you write um, any, a test suite or have a board of any significant complexity, you write your own strategy, which knows better than the example strategy how, which artifacts are needed, how you do the power sequencing, when you need to upload which files and so on. So that's written down, hopefully, in the strategy by using the existing drivers at a level, which you would also use when you explain to a colleague, so you power the board on, Connect it via USB, you use fast boot to upload a kernel, and then you wait until it boots and log into the shop. So that's basically the level of detail I want to have in the strategy source code. My, I have one strategy for all 30 boards. Um, it's, 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 you know, I, I don't want to have 30 scripts, you know, and, and maintain, maintain all that sort of stuff. So, so yeah, that's what we need to figure out. Are you talking about um, the fact that the different boards require different artifacts, like some require DT and some don't, and stuff like that, and some require NITRDs and some don't? And so I, I've been uh, wanting for years for there to be some kind of standard uh, package, or not package isn't the right word, but some kind of standard for describing the artifacts uh, in such a way that uh, it was general enough that you that uh, depend no matter what your board required, the necessary artifacts would be available. So, like a, some kind of I guess an interface between the the it's not an interface, but more like a protocol file system protocol between the build system and the board management system, so that the, you always had the artifacts you needed in a in a consistent like lay, directory layout or whatever it is. You know, it's just a consistent set of names or something. Because right now, right, it'd be great to have to have those decoupled, the build system and the uh, and the board manager decoupled. Uh, but you can't do it because you have this artifact tie between the two. Yeah, I, I agree. That would be very nice to have. But as we are doing embedded stuff and everything is different, um, I don't see it, see it happening soon. At least for 100% of boards. So our approach is to just have it in code and uh, have explicit Python code that handles each specific case. Well, could we at least uh, like uh, standardize on the name of the kernel image? And if it's not the name that your compiled produces, can you like have a symlink to it? I mean, that's, that's the level I'm thinking of. Just, you know, is it capital I image? Uh, is that good enough? Or does it have to be like .gz or .v, you know, vmlinez or... <laughs> then you have the different image formats like it's compressed and the bootloader wants to know if it's compressed or not, so... I mean, it, yeah. it all boils down to ARM platforms or even individual SOC vendors being just using different boot processes, right? And uh, we can't really change what they decided to do inside of the hardware in the ROM code. And that's the fundamental problem, because some of the boards you need a TFA, sometimes it's compiled into the bootloader, some to be, sometimes it needs to be loaded by a firmware image package, and there's just myriads of, of variation, unfortunately. I would like, to be, like it to be all the same, but it unfortunately isn't. At least at the moment, until we get UEFI. I have a question for Simon. Why don't you factor this out into the YAML files? So you can keep one strategy, but just use custom keys in the YAML files 
for the images you have. Um, I think we'll take this discussion uh, to after the, the BOF. Yeah, we, we need to figure it out. But uh, we have some other questions. Yeah, right. Yes. So I guess the next question on the list um, is file system snapshot and restoration advice. So instead of just reflashing the board every time, which is what we do, um, the idea is to take a snapshot and then use the existing snapshot and test on that, I guess. So uh, there's a up in the audience on the right. Okay, d does anybody already does this or has tried that or? So what we're doing basically is uh, using an overlay file system. Uh, the file system is in read-only mode. We mm -hmm. have an overlay in RAM, uh, which has a few limitations like the amount of memory that we have. We are hitting the limit with some use cases. And the other one, uh, I'm a, bit, a little bit ashamed about it. But like we are required to start using Docker in the boards and apparently Docker is not uh, very happy with the overlay file system, so we need to find another solution. Um, I don't know if anyone's doing this. I guess flashing the whole file system is time on one hand, but also like uh, gets the some wear on the memory. And doing this on CI hundreds of times every day, it's... So, so we, we've been flashing some boards on SD cards for years every day and Sometimes SD cards fail and you, you replace them, but it, it's not very widespread. They are pretty robust by now. So one uh, one that we use, of course, like is OS3. OS3 was kind of created to help, you know, like some of the CI CD flow. So it's you know like kind of it's easy like you with Yocto at least you just create it's kind of like Git for file systems. So you just like create a new build and you host it somewhere and then on the device you just pull it and reboot and that's it and you can roll back to the previous one if you don't like. Uh, you can also do it similarly with uh, OS3 on an NFS server. So you don't transfer your full file system to the device and just, just do network booting. That changes some stuff, especially if you're trying to do network testing. Um, but then it's pretty easy to roll back or do uh, ButterFS snapshots or, some, or even if you use images, export them via a USB mass storage gadget, boot from that, maybe boot from a reflink copy of the original file system so you can roll back. So if you move that storage to a Linux host, you can do a lot of uh, easy switches between different versions. And uh, a colleague of mine recently added support for uh, called a USB 9PFS. It's basically you have a way to boot a target which has a USB gadget via USB using 9PFS. So basically what the QMO system uses to access the whole file system. Basically, instead of a guest, you're running your software on the real hardware, but it still uses 9PFS to mount something from the host, which is nice if you do network testing because then you don't have IP addresses to pull the uh, NFS root file system. It's pretty new still, but uh, yeah, that's our plan behind that. Any more infos on the topic? Any more questions? Okay. Um, next one, somebody is seeking suggestions on CAD, so like standardizing on the form factor for their boards. Is that even necessary? Does anybody have Stuff like that. I can shortly give you an overview. We do um, have. Hmm? I think uh, look at the slides from uh, Chris' presentation yes. 22. There are images from our boards, which are basically 19 inch racks, full height, and shelves. So it's 16 boards per rack, and we have by now 10 of those racks in our basement. Um, that's for, for larger scales, probably. But uh, a colleague of mine has these uh, metals with whole, whole plates on his wall. and just mounts the wall, uh, boards in the wall. Uh, that was nice for cabling. Yeah. I wrote a question, so I just want to add something. Um, with professional planning, I'm also looking into more like, I'm having trouble uh, really properly documenting it and making it reproducible. Uh, and aside from saying, yeah, this is what it looks like by this and that, um, but uh, it would be nice to have some sort of I don't know if someone has some advice to basically streamline it, uh, the building process of the farm, so you can reproduce different racks and stuff like that. I, 
think in the previous years there were some uh, talks about this. Um, otherwise, come to the uh, LabGood uh, metrics channel, or IRC channel, or on our GitHub discussions. Um, at least we can point you to the hardware we use. Or, or um, again, the automated testing mailing list. That's more general. I think this uh, test boot mode, uh, try booting kernel A and switching back to booting kernel B, it's probably more about updating in the fields. So that's, I don't see really, that's testing specific or board farming specific. Well, that's okay, so. <laughs> I'll tell you where it comes from. So I only have so many TTY USB cables. So <laughs> I have a bunch of boards that I don't have serial ports on. And the only way I've found to make them kind of halfway um, usable is to, is to, by default, boot into a production kernel. And then if I've set a flag, have it boot into a test kernel. And then, so what I do is I just, every, every time I load something new on the board, I'm, I'm reverting to what I call the safety kernel. And, and so it's, it's a weird way to debug, but it, it re doesn't require that you are going through grub menus with a serial handler and stuff like that. And I think the, the most promising way to get into a situation where we have that is using UEFI on those boards and using a UEFI shell with defined commands. So boards which support EBBR should all behave the same way in that part. So Beyond that, I don't think anyone is working on standardizing that. Documenting the current setup of a place. Uh, yeah, um, we also do that in, uh, in LabGrid Commons. It sounds like a LabGrid specific question. That maybe also relates to configuring drivers in the coordinator on a place. So having more information in the coordinator to don't require so much local configuration for the client. Might make sense. So, if someone wants to work on that, we take the request. <laughs> I don't know if we get around to that soon, otherwise. Sharing test equipment like iperf servers across places. Um, we have thought about something thim similar for. Um, we have a CAN bus connected to many boards and only one test basically can use this shared CAN bus at the same time. So we have some ideas how that could be solved uh, by using something shared resources in LabGrid, but there's nothing implemented. So we basically have logs in CI that make sure that only one CI test is using them as at the same time, nothing integrated. But yeah. So a project called Lab Control that I worked on for a while tried to tackle that problem by assigning resource names and then the test would indicate what resources it needs. And, but it didn't get very far, so. This yeah. Resource scheduling is a uh, There are hands on the right. <laughs> I believe this will be called multi-node in Lava. So you will have two PCs and you would re, uh, reserve both of them at the same time. So that, that would be a way to do it in Lava. We basically can do something similar with the LabGrid reservations. You can basically re um, request multiple tags and multiple places at the same time. So that should basically work to, if you have the shared resource as a place, then the scheduling might already work, but I've not tried it that way. And for, for the iPerf part, uh, you can actually have one server that has multiple ports. It's not iPerf, but it's not, not TCP. And then whenever you connect to it, it just open a new port. So that's, you just need you know, 10 gigabit or more switch in front that is capable of routing everything. And then you just have multiple things in it and 10 gig ethernet on your desktop and or whatever server. And that would be a way to do it also. Yeah, we modeled the iperf like a place, and then we are using the uh, LabGrid as a PyTest uh, mm -hmm. uh, plugin, and we are acquiring all the places we need, and then it's locked in this. this I, I don't know if this is the best practice. <laughs> if it works, I'm not against that. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But it, so the library client has this res reservations mechanism where you can say, I want to have a board or multiple boards with these properties, and then you wait until uh, all of them are free and get a reservation that you can use to lock the place. And that might also work for sharing a single place like this iPerf server. Comparison, oh no, it's uh, overcome USB issues on existing labs with lots of serial to USB adapters. Oh, what USB issues? Uh. Yeah, so, so use smaller USB domains, I'd say. So we've added to our x86 lab servers multiple USB host controllers to just segment that, and it helps, but it doesn't fix it. I went the opposite direction. So I'm using, uh, as recommended by Kevin Hillman, Manhattan 28 port USB hubs. And uh, they seem to work pretty well. Can you put a link in the document? Well, sure. <laughs> so uh, comparison between Lava and LabGrid. Um, also from Simon. Sorry, just maybe there's someone here that's used both and can explain what they're good for. I, I, I understand LabGrid, but not really Lava. Um, so from my perspective, we have a kernel CI lab which uses Lava, and um, it's mostly focused on this. You have a CI system that produces uh, binaries and test jobs, sends them over the HTTP API to the Lava instance, that one goes, waits for a bot to be available, runs the test, collects the result, and then you get basically HTTP callback with the result as a single package. So there's no real interactive communication between something running on the CI system while the test is running. The tests run on, I think it's called the dispatcher in Lava terminology, which executes steps in this Lava test definition. And you don't have any control while the test is running, only get the results afterwards. So that's basically the reason why it's hard to use it for this interactive stuff. But otherwise, if you have many boards of the same type, having the scheduler in the central place is nice because you can just push 100 board uh, jobs for a bigger bone and it will use all working ones to run the tests and get the results back, the results back at some later point. So we are out of time and out of questions. <laughs> yeah. Any closing remarks? Otherwise, I think uh, Ruben and I will be outside uh, to discuss strategy stuff. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot.